<laughs> what? Right, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Well, um, today it's special that I get to be the first one to do it because I really, it's hard to do a long passage, and so I was able to break it up, and, and um, we're going to continue with, with uh, 1 Samuel 17. But before we go forward, I just want to ask a question. This is the, like, the burning question in my soul, and I want you to think about it. You can think about it as we talk. I don't know how many people lived in Israel at the time of Goliath. I don't know how large Goliath's army was. But if you remember, when Samuel went to anoint David king, the three oldest brothers were the first ones brought before Samuel. And they were impressive. They were definitely warrior-like figures, handsome and the like. And the Lord said something very simple. Don't look on the outward appearance. Don't look on the outward appearance. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And one of the testimonies about King David was that he was a man after God's own heart. The vast majority of the Psalms were written by David as he just reflected on who God is in light of the circumstances he was in. And he shared many, many different lessons. So here's the question I want to ask you this morning as we go through the message. Can you be, maybe I should say it, will you be? Will you be someone that our, that our countrymen can depend on? Will you be someone that the brothers and the sisters in Christ can depend on? Will you be somebody in your family that your family can depend on? That when trials and circumstances hit, the first thing you see is the God in heaven whose name is holy and whose ways are perfect and whose plan is without the ability to be defeated. And you see that God and you honor that God. You have faith to speak in the present circumstances in light of the God of heaven. That's what we can be as Christians. As we shared the Lord's Supper and just pondered that reality. That's our lot. That's our called expectation. And so I want us to just keep that in the, in the back of our heart as we go through today's message. So today's message is supposed to say part one on there, but anyway, when you face giants, part one. But um, today's doctrine we're going to focus on visible fears can obscure the invisible God. Visible fears can obscure the invisible God. I want you to understand one thing. Satan only has the ability to deceive and to lie and to paint a false picture and if you're a person like me I'm a very visual person and when I see things with my eyes it's it's an instantaneous kind of play on me I tend to be encouraged and positive if things look good and if things look poorly I tend to get discouraged and troubled and that's a struggle that I have probably a struggle that most humans have but Satan will always blow up our adversaries and who knows exactly how tall Goliath really was maybe he was only seven feet <laughs> but he sure looked like he was nine feet so let's go forward now I have in here one word that I've defined it's a part of the pre-application Visible fears can obscure the invisible God. Goliath used the term defy. I defy the armies of Israel. And the Hebrew word there means to expose by stripping. 
I thought, what a, what a powerful word picture to expose by stripping. So in the flesh, in the natural realm of things, Satan loves to defy who we are because who we are is something that's way beyond what we can even imagine if that person is in Christ walking by faith. But who we aren't is what we pretty much see when we look at ourselves in the mirror. And so it's a temptation. If you've ever been in a situation on the playground or some other kind of public place where children mock children, they're making fun of whatever attribute they see in the child that makes them look weak and lesser than the rest. And Satan just loves to do that. And you and I are going to have that battle our whole life. We might go to a school where the principal says we're not going to have that here. And the bullies may be punished properly. But I want to tell you something. If your security against Satan's defiance is somebody else coming to your rescue, then you're hugely at risk. I want you to think of that whole vast army. The three older brothers of David. They all had the same family upbringing. David was the youngest of eight. The whole army cowering. King Saul cowering. Because they're focusing on the outward appearance and not on the person and the name of the Lord our God. So this whole concept then of what Goliath was doing, you and I have to understand. If you take it personally, you've already lost the battle. And if you whine and complain and feel sorry for yourself and complain to this person and that person and walk about in a stupor of grudge because you haven't been treated right and you live you can live your life you can be 90 years old still struggling with a bad self-image because other people were impolite to you and I know it hurts and I know it's hard but the question isn't are other people mean we all know that man is sinful and fallen and I dare say one of the scriptures says and I can't quote it just perfectly off the top of my head but but there's a scripture that says and you know good and well that you yourself have spoken against other people on occasion it's in the Proverbs you know talking about if you hear somebody speak against you well actually it said don't go to your servant's door and listen to what he's saying because you're gonna hear him talk about you <laughs> just give, give it a break you know good and well you've said you've done the same thing so our, our concern here at this hour our concern in this in this message today is what are you going to do with the defiance of Satan now I have a little passage here from Matthew 14 on the screen and so they saw Jesus walking on the sea and they were terrified it's a ghost, they cried out in fear. Now again, pay close attention to yours and my temperament. We have a natural filter. What we process through the natural eye. And you and I know good and well, nobody has ever seen anybody walking on water. Add to that a stormy sea, Perhaps clouds blowing and maybe the moon flashing here and there. And it begins to be a little bit trepidatious. But obviously there was enough light to see Jesus. I don't think he was glowing in the dark. Maybe he was. I don't know. <laughs> but the reality is they trusted what they saw. And what they saw was, un was impossible. And it scared them. And I want you to understand. <laughs> okay, I got to be really careful because I get afraid too. But when you're afraid, you've taken a position that 
You have full knowledge of everything that you need to know so that you're capable of judging that situation and to run for your life. Now, there are times that it's important to run for your life. And those things are come clear. But what we need to understand here at the, at the onset is never let fear take you. Let the thing of fear coming at you bring you right immediately to the throne of God so that you remember who's in charge. So that you might be like Esther who faced her fear and she faced it spiritually. And she summarized it, you know what? If I die, I die. I'm gonna trust God for his purposes and I'm gonna do something that's right and I'm gonna put my fear aside and realize if I, I may die but if I die I'm just I'm I'm trusting God with my death that is such huge victory and then Peter says Lord if it is you command me to come out on the water to you and Jesus said come so Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus can you believe it nobody's ever done that before or since that I know of but when he saw the wind he was afraid and beginning to sink he cried out Lord save me Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him and say oh you of little faith why did you doubt when they got into the boat the wind ceased and I need, I need us to understand this morning as we go forward you are not going to live a life where you have no fears. You must learn to live a life that knows how to handle your fears in faith. And practice it. Parents, help your children practice it. When things come along that truly terrify them. I remember a really precious story my wife shared with the children. And it came from one of the Psalms, but it was a precious story. But it's centered around the Psalm that says, when I am afraid, I will trust in him. Short picture. Fear leads us to the cross. Fear leads us to prayer. Okay, so now let's pick it up. What happened before? Now, this is actually the first part of um, what Joel read, verse 12. So it's giving a little bit of background again to David like we hadn't just gone through chapter 16. And it said, David was the son of Jesse and Ephrathite. Jesse was from Bethlehem and Judah, and he had eight sons. In Saul's time, Jesse was an old man, and his three oldest sons followed Saul to war. First son was Eliab, second was Abinadab, and the third was Shammah. And David was the youngest son. And Jesse's three oldest sons followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to Bethlehem. And there he took care of his father's sheep. So I just want you to get the picture for a moment, okay? We just finished chapter 16. Chapter 16, David was anointed. Chapter 16, David went to Saul's household and he played the harp for King Saul because he was skilled at the harp. And we have this snapshot here that for some reason, for some reason, David was so important to watching those sheep was he went back and forth from Saul if you remember in chapter 16 Saul had requested can David come and stay with me in the palace and so he came but now we we hear we see here David came but he went back and forth to keep track of the sheep so I'm sure there must have been some other hireling that was a part of it but I but I really want us to understand something about David's heart a heart that is not filled with pride is also a heart that cannot easily be filled with fear. Because pride is the predecessor to great fear. Pride is the great predecessor to fear. When I have something that's near and dear and I think my identity is wrapped up in that thing and it becomes extremely important to me, my potential for fear is huge. If something comes in to threaten that, it's huge. 
But I, and it's an astonishing thing. Now, David was still young. I don't know how young. Some say maybe 16, 17 in that range. But he went back and forth from the king's palace. He'd go to the king's palace and play the harp for a while and go back home and play for the sheep. But he wasn't, you know, he's the anointed king. Okay, you have to understand this. Okay? He was the anointed king. It's no small matter of what took place. But he didn't change who he was. And so when the, when the scripture says that God raised himself up a king out of the sheepfolds, he saw David's heart and that it was not about himself or his fame. It was about being a servant, that caring for the sheep. He cared for the sheep like they were as important as anything else on earth. And as a result, faithfulness grew in his heart. Let's continue. So what was the problem? Well, as we read during communion, which was an easy way for me to get some of the passage in, <laughs> the Philistine came out every morning and every evening, and he stood before the Israelite army, and this continued for 40 days. I don't know if you, if you can get that picture. 40 days, there's no combat, there's this standoff, and morning and night, Goliath comes out and challenges Israel. 40 days, that's a long time. That's a very long time. You can, you can imagine that anybody, or maybe you can say everybody, would take you know, a day or so to figure out what's going on. But to be held under the fear, the bondage to that fear of Goliath, and never to shake yourself free to look at the Lord. And I'm just asking myself a question. Are you kidding me? In all of Israel? There's only one, there's only one man who had the capacity to see God first in the dilemma? You're kidding me. That's a huge statement. And I just want to simply say this. I struggle with this emotionally, but I think I see that today as well. So many Christians are just tumbleweeds. They're just following along and they're getting their encouragement from being around other Christians or whatever, but they don't cultivate the tension of heart to recognize that when I have something fearful coming into my life, that I need to first see the glory of God and trust Him and then make my plan, not the plan to honor my name, but to defend the honor of God. So, when Saul and all the Israelites heard these words, they were very afraid. And then again, later on in the same passage, when the Israelites saw Goliath, this was now when David was present, they were very much afraid and ran away. And they said, look at this man, Goliath. He keeps coming out to speak against Israel. And they said, why did I write it twice? I don't know. Forgive me. <laughs> yeah, all right. They were stuttering. They were so nervous. So, um, what was said or done? Now, now it's interesting to see how this, I, I just love the storytelling of this chapter. It's an amazing. Um, it's, it's like somebody created the DDM method out of, out of watching how they did it here. But Jesse said to his younger son, David, take this half bushel of cooked grain and 10 loaves of bread and take them to your brothers in the camp and take 10 pieces of cheese and give them to the commander of your brother's group of thousand soldiers. See how your brothers are coming and bring back something to show to me they're all right. Uh, this is the, ch the children's version. I forget the. <clears throat> your brothers are with Saul in the army of the Valley of the Elah and they're fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David took, left the sheep with another shepherd. He took the food and left as Jesse had told him. What a, just a remarkable thing. There's David back at home watching the sheep finds another substitute shepherd, goes off and does what his dad's asking him to do as a courier taking food to his, to his brothers. So when we're still under the what was said or done and quite a bit is said here, when David arrived at camp, the army was leaving. Now that would mean they were leaving their morning encampment. They were going out to their battle positions. The soldiers were shouting their war cry that's, that has to be kind of funny, though, know, if you played a video of it. You know, so you, 40 days this is going on, all right? So this might be 40, day 41, I don't know. But, but they get up, in the back of everybody's mind is this guy alive, right? 
But here in their camp, you know, they just broke from mess hall, and you know how the football players get a little huddle. All right, let's go. You know, stir themselves up. They're going to go take on the enemy. <laughs> and then there's a guy, Goliath, and everybody runs for their life. It's like, what a vain thing. You know, what kind of a stirring up of your... Uh, maybe the war cry was softer and softer every morning. I don't know. So David left the food with the man who kept the supplies, and he ran to the battle line and talked to his brothers. While, and while he was talking, Goliath came out. He was the Philistine champion from Gath, and he shouted things at Israel as usual, and David heard it. And when the Israelites saw Goliath, they were very much afraid and ran away. And they said, look at this man Goliath, he keeps coming out to speak against Israel. The king will give much money to the man who kills Goliath. And he will also give his daughter in marriage to whoever kills him. And his father's family will not have to pay taxes in Israel. So obviously, that's pretty significant. You could be tax-free the rest of your life, for your, your whole family, and get the king's daughter, and uh, be very wealthy. Continuing on what was said or done, then David asked the men who stood near him, what will be done to reward the man who kills this Philistine? What will be done for whoever takes away the shame from Israel? Now listen very carefully. This is what David sees. Instead of a giant terrifying the land, this is what David sees. What will be done for whoever takes away the shame from Israel? Goliath is a Philistine. He's not circumcised. Why does he think he could speak against the armies of the living God? The Israelites told David what they had been saying, and they said, this is what will be done for the man who kills Goliath. Now here's the saddest part of the whole story. And, um, older brother, younger brother. As we look at this, I just want to make a comment ahead of time here. Children, children, children. First thing I have to say to you, by the time you're old, you're going to have cre you're going to have a package of offenses that have been against you. Okay, it's just going to be true. The larger your family, perhaps the bigger the package. You're not going to be happy. There's going to be things that were done, and and if you find somebody, you can find you can find somebody. Sit down and say, "Can you believe what happened to me? This, this is what happened to me." And then you're going to find somebody. It'll probably be a liberal who will listen. Oh, you poor thing. I can't believe they did that to you. That shouldn't be. But, but we do that. Now, I, I want to make myself plainly honest here. When I left home at age 18, I felt sorry for myself. I felt like I had been mistreated. And, I, and I, in my early days of college, I noticed that I was constantly looking for, usually it was a woman, a mom or a daughter, somebody just to whine and complain about my terrible sad lot. And, you know, truth of it is, all women are liberal. <laughs> till they get converted. Just kidding, just kidding. Now I'm gonna stick something in here and Sally left, so you have to ask her to get the, 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 the site. But she read to me something the other night. They've done this tremendous research and they've discovered that they decided to research women's brains as they go through the process of having a child and raising the child. And they found that in the part of your brain where empathy and love and tenderness dwells, that part of the brain grows substantially. I mean, the brain, the size of the brain itself grows in that area. And it enables the mom to tune in to emotionally to the child's needs and tactically to how to manage those needs. And the amazing thing is, a woman that never has a child doesn't ever have that trigger. It's an amazing kind of thing. Now, I don't know what kind of um, 
trigger, trigger, if it's a hormone trigger or whatever, and if you adopt, I, I do know one thing with adoption, it's always harder to bond to an adopted child just because the child is so um, damaged and wounded. And so often adoptive parents get damaged and wounded in trying to reach out to an adoptive child because the child can't receive their love. Anyway, getting back to the picture, um, it's a huge, it was a huge study. And they discovered that after a year and a half, some of that intensive caring for a child diminishes and the, and the brain will shrink back a little bit, but never back to its original size. And then it continues on and it gets re-triggered with instances when you're a grandmother and that kind of thing as well. So it's just an amazing thing that we're, we're made differently. I want to say we're wired differently, but we have, we have different capacities but we need to understand, and men, one of the most important things to be man about is to be able to recognize, yes, there is pain and sorrow and to have, have reasonable empathy. But never in my life as a pastor have I made any progress with anybody that I've counseled, ever. When my only counsel was, wow, I really see how sad your life is and how much you've been hurt and I'm really sorry for you and then I stop what'd you say no I said I can't do that because that's nothing I didn't say anything human empathy doesn't accomplish very much but if you understand this pain and the sorrow and you can paint a picture, you know what, I know this is hard, but you, you need to back up a little bit and see what God's doing. God's doing something so exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ever imagine that you just need to get your eyes on God and embrace this, receive this, and stop kicking against the goads as the Lord said to, to Paul on the road to Damascus. So here's David and his older brother Eliab and he hears David talking with the soldiers and he becomes angry with David. And he asks David, now I just want you to think, you know, you gotta put this back when I was a child and I didn't get this part. You gotta put this sentence back in the context. David is anointed king. A substantial outpouring of the Holy Spirit has visited David so much so that the king's palace heard of it. And he was asked to come to the king's palace to minister to the king. David has been going back and forth to the palace for a good amount of time. I don't, it doesn't say. And so David's brother Eliab has a problem. And if you're an older brother and you have a younger brother who's more successful than you, this might be a struggle that you have to deal with. But <clears throat> Eli became angry, and his anger and his jealousy became the filter that he processed information through. And note, look, look what he says. <laughs> Why did you come out here? Well, he had already said. He had already brought the cheese and the grain and the loaves of bread. And he had already said, Dad wants to know how you guys are doing. I know you're proud. <coughs> <coughs> Hebrew says, and the wickedness of your heart. You just came down to watch the battle. Now, if you remember back in the days, back in the days, back at the time frame that we were going through chapter 16, <coughs> remember I uh, hypothetically thought, you know, what else could David have done? Well, he could have been what his brother's accusing him of. He could have entrusted his sheep to somebody to care for them and gone and see what's going on at that banquet. But he didn't. He was a very upright young man. And his brother was accusing him outlandishly just purely because of jealousy. And <laughs> David asked, what have I done wrong? Can I even talk? And that's that's uh, one of the translations of it, but I like the King James a little better. Is there not a cause? And he turned away. <clears throat> you know, uh, that's the greatest response to a proud, angry brother that I could imagine. 
to give a brief statement, what have I done wrong, and you turn your back. Is there not a cause? Turn your back. You do what you're supposed to do. You don't let the jealousy of somebody else, and it's possible, just don't ever forget, it's always possible for a younger child to be bullied by an older, an older sibling by their jealousy because that structure has existed in the family for a good amount of time. Going on then, he says, and they turned to other people and asked the same questions, and they gave him the same answer as before. So let's wrap it up. What are some of the choices? David could have been too proud to be his father's career, but he wasn't. He was a man after God's own heart. And Eliab could have been respectful and confided in David with anticipation. You know, if Eliab had had any spiritual bones in his body, if he wasn't a proud, arrogant man, which he was, he would have realized, David, David, you're here. I got a problem here. And he would have, he would have himself shared the problem. But he was so focused on his ego, he was so focused on his pride, that he couldn't, he didn't have the slightest capacity to see the bigger need of the whole nation of Israel. And all he did was act out of his jealousy. Is that going to happen to us? Sometimes it is. Can we let it get us down? We can't. David walked in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He sidestepped the bitter jealousy of his brother. And his brother missed a huge opportunity. So what are some spiritual lessons we can wrap up with here? Again, if you remember, I asked that first question. Can you believe it? In all of Israel, no one had the capacity to remember the awesome, mighty God who had delivered them and brought them into Israel, whose name was holy. And I just, I just, I think that's terrifying. And I just want us to realize, everyday ordinary life wears you down. Everyday ordinary life tends to cause you to see more and more with the temporal eye and less and less with the spiritual. One of the greatest gifts God has chosen to give his people is the gift of trouble or tribulation. He deliberately wants us to have our, what do you call it, our agenda crossed, our feelings stumped. He's, he's after getting our attention. Because the Bible says in Romans 8, somewhere around verse 20 something or other, he says, um, if we didn't have these frustrations come into our life, <clears throat> we would never seek the Lord. We would never find the greater good. We would be happy. So I just want to pause for a moment today. So I'm going to make a judgment on you, but I think it's an honest judgment. I think you're human. That's a judgment. I really don't know. I haven't done a DNA test on you yet. <clears throat> but I think you're human. And if you're human, you're also a sinner. And if you're a sinner, your primary struggle as a sinner is keeping alive, staying alive. Your flesh wants to thrive and be alive. And that's where you are. That's who you are. So in every circumstance that you come into, your first instinctive response is to save yourself. And the disciples of Jesus are not called to save ourselves, but we're called to give up our lives for Christ's sake and the gospel. And to discover suddenly that we found our lives. We really truly found life. So it's imperative that we understand that my attitude and my devotion to God matters more than any other thing. And the circumstances I am in are not the primary thing I need to focus on. Just in my circumstances, I trust the Lord. Who knows where God will take me? Man might shove you on the back pasture watching a bunch of mangy sheep. But the Lord sees your heart. Be a man or woman after God's own heart. So what are the spiritual lessons of God? Well, God chose David. Now, I'm quoting here from Psalm 78. God told, chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the nursing ewes, and he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, Israel, his inheritance. And with an upright heart, he shepherded them and guided them with a skillful hand. What an incredible statement. What an incredible testimony. 
that the humility of serving in the least way possible prepared David for serving in the greatest way possible. Maybe we could speak of a spiritual truism. The more successful you and I are in serving God in the least ways that are there to be done, uncompensated, maybe that's what's going to prepare us to do something far greater. The more minuscule your successful labor, the greater capacity you'll have to do a greater work. Because what happens when you're truly lowly, even when you're in a position of significant authority, you're not, it, it didn't go to your head. You're not full of pride and self-accomplishment. You're still a servant. And you still know how to find God's interests at the hour, at that occasion. David, foreigners will take care of your sheep. <laughs> foreigners will work in your fields and vineyards. And you will be called the Lord's priests, servants of our God. And you will enjoy the wealth of nations and boast about the riches you've received from them. <clears throat> now that's from Isaiah 61, verses 5 and 6. And the whole chapter 61 is astonishing. It begins, of course, with that prophecy of Jesus. And this is speaking of the fruitfulness when Israel is finally a nation redeemed. <clears throat> but I just want you to see something about David here. Even in Israel, how many years later, after David's great reign, just before Israel is deported into, into bondage by the Babylonians. Shepherding sheep was considered the lowest job. Shepherding sheep, keeping fields and vineyards, it's the lowest job for slaves. So I want us to understand about David. He was never, never, never too proud to be doing the lowest job. But he did the lowest job with the biggest vision of who God is. That's what I want to be. That's who we can be. Eliab. Eliab. Listen to this little one-liner here. <laughs> Although Eliath, Eliab was afraid of Goliath's giant stature, he was far too impressed with his own stature compared to David. Isn't that amazing? Think about that. The cowardly Eliab was so full of himself in front of David, putting him down and calling him names, accusing his motives. And I just want us to catch that contradiction. You'll never escape your fears if you live by them. If you expect yourself to be something you're nothing, if you expect other people to cower before you because you're somebody, you're living in that realm of the demonic and you have very little to hope for. That's a huge spiritual lesson for us to have. So what was the result? God was honored by David. David's true love and faith in God was drawn out by the circumstances that provoked him to speak up for God's holy name. But Eliab was left wallowing in childhood bitterness and jealousy. I doubt that Eliab was even able to hooray after the, guy, the giant was killed. Is probably off to the back, just kind of pouting still. I don't know. But that's where he's headed. He can't rejoice. So, so I just want to ask a question. Today, do we see Christians sensitive to God's honor and fear in the face of giant conflicts? I need to remember that. What, what, what Joel shared at the beginning, of the, just before the Lord's Supper, it's huge. We're called to that lifestyle of being singled out and being terrorized by Satan. And when it happens, it's hugely, it's, hu it's hugely inappropriate and terrifying and unbelievable. And it's so easy to look on the outside of how horribly terrible and unrighteous it is. But we can never forget, we can never forget. You're just called to do one thing. Let go of your life for Jesus' sake. Let go of your life for Jesus' sake. Always have Jesus and his interest in your heart and in your mind. And when a circumstance comes your way, let, it, let your light life go. If you die, you die. That's our heritage. We can do this. Let's pray.
Father, we have many giants of our fears because unbeknownst to us we have large portions of pride still still yet to be dealt with, still yet to be put off in, in earnest and true humility. Pray for the children, Lord, that you might open their hearts to see and understand that as a child they can trust you, they can desire your interests and honor your name in every circumstance, even as a child. And as they grow, they'll be more and more capable of serving you in many more areas. Thank you, Lord, that it's not about uh, good education, fighting our way to the top, but it's about trusting you and serving you and doing what we're called to do, being, being happy slaves to fill up whatever moments, being trained and taught in whatever fashion that you deem fit, and embracing it and receiving it. Let that be the lot, Lord, for all of us, but we especially ask it for our children. Pray in Christ's holy name. Amen.